Hello and welcome to this session on quality and safety in home services, a presentation on the five key areas of risk. My name is Rebecca Cross and I'm from the Australian Aged Care Quality and Safety Commission. Let's begin with an acknowledgement of country. In the spirit of reconciliation, I would like to acknowledge the traditional custodians of country throughout Australia and their connections to land, water and community. I pay my respects to their elders past, present and emerging and extend that respect to all Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander peoples. This presentation is for home care service providers to give you an overview and understanding of risk management, the five key areas of risk identified by the Commission and your role and responsibilities in managing these risks. Here's an overview of what we will cover today. We will look at a quick overview of risk management, the five key areas of risk in home care services and management of these risks. I'll share some information with you along with some case studies and questions where you can pause and consider how you would respond. Let's start with a quick overview of risk management. I firstly wanted to highlight a commission resource that provides a guidance for governing bodies of home services on the five key areas of risk. If you'd like to access this resource, the web address is on the screen. I'll be using this document to frame a lot of what I cover today and will refer you back to it for more detailed information on what we cover in some areas. Just a heads up that at times I'll be referring to older people as consumers to be consistent with the terminology used in the guidance document. So what is the purpose of the guidance? It describes the key areas of risk in delivering home services to raise awareness of commonly observed issues and how these result in risks to consumers. It provides prompts, examples, and key considerations to educate you around your responsibilities. It emphasizes your accountability for the delivery of safe and quality home services and promotes a culture of uh, self-assurance. Let's touch on risk management. So risk management is a culture that has to be shared by everyone within the organization and not just a selected few. You may wish to pause here and think about how you would define risk management what system do you have to manage risks identified within your organisation? Let's look at what risk management is in a little bit more detail. It's the process of identifying, assessing, managing and monitoring potential risks in order to minimise the negative impact that they may have on people. Risk stems from a variety of sources, including financial uncertainties, legal liabilities, technology issues, strategic management errors, accidents and natural disasters, compliance and legislation requirements, just to name a few. A successful risk management program will help you consider the full range of risks your organisation faces, and you can do that by considering the processes which are listed on the screen. A risk management framework provides the foundation for designing, implementing, monitoring and reviewing risk management within an organisation. While different providers will have different risk management frameworks and systems in place, the same principles apply. So what are some of the benefits of effective risk management for home care services? It may include uh, keeping older people safe and free from potential or actual harm, identifying services that older people need to remain independent in their homes for as long as possible, detecting risks that are not apparent. Many of the real risks you face may not be apparent. So having a comprehensive preventive risk management program will help identify and provide a deeper understanding of all the types of risks that your organisation may be facing. It reduces breaches of duty of care and improves quality of services provided to older people. Again, having a preventive risk management program can minimise risks due to negligence and breaches of duty of care. It provides insights and support to the governing body, so board members may find it difficult to identify risks outside their areas of expertise and experience. Providing resources and advisory services to the board and its committee charged with risk management will make them better able to carry out their duties. And it provides confidence to regulators. Whilst it is impossible to avoid risk and the manifestation of risk into potential problems, regulators such as the Commission, the Department of Health and Aged Care, want to see that an event is not due to a systemic breakdown and that you have measures in place such as proper governance and leadership, incident management and training to prevent or reduce the key areas of risk. As a provider of aged care, you are responsible for understanding and meeting all of your, your obligations, including the requirements of the Aged Care Act of 1997 and associated legislation, and all the relevant requirements under the Aged Care Quality Standards. 
and the quality of care principles of 2014 and the user rights principles of 2014. So these expectations are also enshrined in Quality Standard 8, which is about organisational governance and in particular requirement 3D on risk management. And as home care providers, you're required to demonstrate effective risk management systems and practices. So these include managing high impact or high prevalence risks associated with consumer care, identifying and responding to abuse and neglect of consumers. So we know elder abuse has become an increasingly topical issue in recent years and providers must implement appropriate procedures in identifying incidents of abuse and neglect and reporting such incidents, both within your organisation and to the appropriate legal authority, say, for example, through SIRS, the Serious Incident Response Scheme, where applicable. Um, it also includes supporting consumers to live the best life they can and managing and preventing incidents, including the use of an incident management system. Now let's take a look at the five key areas of risk in detail. So through analysis of complaints, performance assessments, compliance outcomes, and other data and intelligence, the Commission has identified five key areas of risk in home services. This is a snapshot of all five areas. They are organisational governance, care planning and assessment, clinical care, vulnerable consumers, and management of packaged funds. We're focusing on these specific risk areas because they are common areas of complaint or non-compliance and can have significant impacts for older people. We'll go through each of these in more detail. The first risk area is organisational governance. The Commission has identified organisational governance as a key area of non-compliance in home services. Many organisations providing home services may be small businesses that lack mature governance structures, information management systems and risk management processes. This means that providers may not maintain adequate oversight of the care and services being delivered and are less able to identify deficiencies and drive positive outcomes for older people as well as drive continuous improvement. The Commission sees values in organisation governance where there is inadequate oversight of those services that are subcontracted or brokered. Providers fail to recognise that even when services are subcontracted to other organisations or individuals, it remains their responsibility to maintain oversight of these contracted services. And failure to maintain oversight of care delivery can lead to gaps and breakdowns in the person's care. Also, organisations where a high proportion of staff are subcontractors without adequate oversight of these staff. Where you subcontract most or all of your staff, this can create challenges for, for maintaining oversight of quality of care and regulatory compliance, including staff competency, communication information, receiving feedback, ensuring continuity of care for older people as well. Regardless of whether staff delivering services are employees or subcontractors, it is your responsibility to ensure they operate in line with regulatory responsibilities and best practice. Next, organisations that are franchised and do not have consistency or alignment with the quality standards in service delivery. That's a risk. Some, franch some franchises develop and maintain a set of policies and procedures that must be used by all fr franchisees. Where these procedures are not compliant or effective and result in potential risks to older people, this is the legal responsibility of the franchisee. If you run a franchise business operating under the brand of another business, you have to ensure your governance systems and practices are compliant and effective. Organisations that don't maintain appropriate oversight of risks for older people who self-manage their care packages is another risk. In self-managed care, the consumer is active in managing the practical tasks of their home care and the provider continues to be responsible for ensuring quality and safe care that meets the needs of the consumer. Some providers don't maintain appropriate oversight where the consumer self-manages their home care package, including to undertake an assessment of the person's needs, noting that a person's self-assessment is not sufficient. This means that care needs, goals and preferences are often not adequately assessed and the older person may not be receiving the care and services they need. It can also result in them spending their home care package funds inappropriately, for example, purchasing excluded items. Consumers wishing to have more independence around the management of their home care package does not remove your responsibility to appropriately assess and plan for their needs, goals and preferences, as well as manage risks to their health and wellbeing, monitor outcomes and review their care. All providers must remain involved with their self-managed clients to make sure they have the care and support that they need. So having considered the risk of organisational governance, let's put that into the context of a case study for Benny. 
Listen to the case study about Benny who is receiving some support at home. After the video, you'll be able to pause and consider the questions that follow. All Well Home Care supplies home care sharing services to consumer Benny. As Benny lives outside All Well's normal service area, All Well subcontracts his sharing service to subcontractor Medi Services. Benny has reduced mobility and needs a showering chair when showering. Last week, when staff from Medi Services were delivering Benny's showering service, he sustained a fall and was hurt. Benny's daughter Lindy was angry when she learned of her dad's fall and lodged a complaint with Allwell. Lindy also claimed she notified Allwell of her dad's mobility decline in the last three months and there should have been plans to prevent his fall. Lindy also claimed that Allwell had not been in regular contact with her dad and there had been inadequate monitoring of his condition. Allwell investigated the complaint and discovered that there was no verification of the training and skill competency of the subcontractor staff, example manual handling when delivering sharing services. Benny's care plan did not document his mobility issues. As a result, the care plan provided to the subcontractor did not identify the mobility concerns. There were only eight progress notes in the last four months stating contractor staff had delivered showering services to Benny and contact with Benny by all well staff was irregular. Let's pause here to think about what some of the root or underlying causes you can identify in this scenario. Here are three root or underlying causes that we've identified. Billy hasn't been included or consulted in his assessment and care planning. There's a lack of or inadequate communication and Billy's needs are not met by contracted staff as they were not informed of the changes in his needs. Secondly, uh, contracted staff may lack training or experience to conduct their tasks. They didn't have all of the information to deliver the required services, for example, Billy's preferences and choice. And thirdly, the provider didn't have processes to ensure contracted services were delivered in line with the specifications outlined in Billy's care and service plan, or that contracted workers are kept informed about changes. Now pause to think about how you would treat the risk area of organisational governance for this service in both the short and long term. Let's take a closer look at the third root cause I mentioned, which was that the provider didn't have processes to ensure contracted services were delivered in line with specifications outlined in Billy's care and service plans, or that contracted workers are kept informed about these changes. If we think about risk treatments in the short term, the organisation should have proper information management processes in place so that any change of service needs is reflected in the service plans and effectively communicated between all parties involved in the person's care, in this case, Billy's care. They should uh, also have processes in place to keep subcontractors in the loop for any changes to the older person's condition or needs and ensure they are identified, monitored and escalated as necessary. Also ensure risks are captured in the provider's risk management framework so that any risks to the person's health, safety and well-being are identified and appropriate strategies put in place to mitigate these risks and or their potential impact and have effective incident management and open disclosure processes. Now, if we think about risk treatments in the long term, the organisation could consider having processes for the monitoring of delivery of services such as scheduled internal audits on care plans and service delivery, and check that they are regularly reviewed to align with the person's needs, goals and preferences. So we've unpacked one of the root or underlying causes to give you an idea of the types of things to focus on. If you'd like to explore the other two causes and what to focus on, access the risk guidance from page 10. And remember, regardless of whether your organisation is part of a franchise, subcontracts or brokers delivery of part or all of the services delivered to older people, or whether consumers self-manage their services, 
It's your legal responsibility to ensure those services are delivered in line with the quality standards and other relevant requirements. Next, we'll take a look at risk area two, care planning and assessment. The Commission has identified that some home service providers fail to undertake appropriate assessment and care planning and ensure it is appropriately communicated and available at the point of care. This can lead to depriving consumers of the care and services that they need. Let's consider what it looks like when there are issues in care planning and assessment. The Commission is seeing failures like failure to undertake assessment of each person's needs, goals and preferences. Some providers undertake a limited assessment that doesn't identify the full range of needs nor how the person's condition may impact the risks associated with the care and service delivery. For example, how a person's home environment, clinical and cognitive condition may impact delivery of personal care or domestic services. There's a reliance on aged care assessment team or regional assessment service assessments to inform care, inform care planning rather than undertaking their own detailed assessment, meaning assessments may be inaccurate or outdated. And this can lead to the person receiving care and services that don't meet their needs. There's inadequate assessment of people who self-manage their home care packages and failure to monitor and regularly reassess the care needs of these consumers. Then there's failure to validate your services assessment tools. Some providers don't use validated, evidence-based, best practice assessment tools and or do not have appropriately skilled and qualified staff undertaking assessments. And this can lead to significant deficits in care planning and delivery. You should ensure that your assessment tools capture all required information and be appropriate to the scope of practice of the clinical staff undertaking those assessments. Next is failure to tailor care planning. We see use of generic, templated or non-personalised care planning to direct the delivery of each person's care and services. Care plans that lack specific detail, making it challenging to deliver appropriate care and services that are tailored to each individual's needs, goals and preferences. While te templates can be used to guide and inform the assessment process, they need to enable you to capture necessary personalised information. And lastly, failure to coordinate, communicate and ensure information is available at the point of care. Here we see some providers who don't centrally coordinate care planning or ensure that all parties involved in care delivery have sufficient, current and appropriate information available at the point of care to enable them to deliver care and services. And this means that staff delivering services don't always have access to the information needed to guide service delivery. And again, it also means the provider may not have appropriate oversight of the person's care and services, and care may be disjointed, disorganised and otherwise poorly managed. Now let's put this risk area into the context of a case study. Safe Care Home Care delivers personal services to consumers in their homes. Some services they provide include support activities of daily living, such as grocery shopping, transportation, and helping with personal care and hygiene. The Home Care Coordinator receives several incident reports from their staff about consumers injured during transportation service delivery. Several of the consumers were badly injured and hospitalised. Concerned about this trend, the Home Care Coordinator alerted the CEO of the service. As a result, the CEO initiated an internal audit and made the following audit findings. Many of their consumers' needs and conditions have changed, but their care plans did not reflect these changes. Some of the consumers' mobility issues have deteriorated. According to Safe Care's policy, staff must review consumer care plans regularly However, many of the care plans have not been reviewed in the last 12 months. The generic care plan template used by staff did not enable staff to capture all the necessary personalised information. As a result, important information about the consumers were missing. When 
interviewed, almost all of the consumers were confused about what they can and cannot do with their home care package funds. Staff completed most care planning with little or no input from consumers or their families and other health professionals such as the consumer's GP. Some staff did not know the correct manual handling technique to transfer consumers. Others say they have little knowledge of consumers' mobility issues and have not updated their training on falls due to a heavy work schedule and lack of time. So pause for a moment to think about what the root causes or underlying issues are in this scenario and how you would treat the risks. You've had a bit of a think about the root underlying causes that can be seen in this scenario. On the screen, you can see six that we have identified. One, older people and their representatives have not been included in their assessment and care planning and there's a lack of communication. Two, other care delivery partners such as their GP have not been included in the care planning and assessments. Three, older people are not able to make informed decisions as they don't understand what they can and can't do with their home care package funds. Four, care planning and assessments are not documented to clearly articulate the person's needs, goals and preferences and there's missing information. Five, care needs were not being reviewed and reassessed regularly. And six, staff lack training, experience or competency to identify changes in um, a person's condition. Let's take a look at some suggested risk treatments for one of these in more detail. More specifically, number two. And again, for the other root causes, you can find information on what to focus on by referring back to the risk guidance from page 14. So how can we treat this risk? You can engage with other care delivery partners. You should identify partners in care and where necessary, seek the older person's consent to engage with them. This may include the older person's representatives, carers, family members or loved ones, and other health professionals, service providers, and community organisations. You should refer the person to other service providers to ensure their care needs are appropriately met. So these care delivery partners will help you to identify what services and support the older person is receiving elsewhere, prioritise what should be provided under their home care package and better understand their circumstances, needs, goals and preferences. Speak with these delivery partners about what care and services you'll be providing under the older person's home care package and adopt a holistic and comprehensive approach to care and service delivery. You should clarify any assumptions you may have about what supports they may be receiving elsewhere to ensure all delivery partners are on the same page and that there will be no unintentional duplication, gaps or oversight in the person's care. Here's a couple of things to think about when it comes to care planning and assessment. Firstly, what happens within your organisation when an older person refuses care from, for an identified need? So some things to consider include explain the risks to the person and document the conversation, acknowledge their right to take risks to live the best life they can, work with them to assess the risk and put in place agreed strategies to minimise any risks and ensuring that it's documented and communicated as necessary. Any changes to their care and services, including any changes to fees and charges, must be discussed with them. So they have a right to understand how their funds are being spent and to negotiate any changes. They should direct their home care package, what's included, how services are delivered and the provider from which they choose to receive care and services. Also think about what happens in your organisation if the current level of package funds does not support the increased needs of the older person. And remember any changes in their care plan or their home care agreement must be made in consultation with them and agreed by them as well. And where changes in their condition result in increased care needs and the current level of package funds doesn't support the increased needs, you should also refer the person to uh, My Age Care for reassessment to determine further funding eligibility. When someone is awaiting a higher level of care already, or already receiving a level four package, you may need to consider other options. So some examples might be reviewing their care plan to identify alternatives and priorities, such as reducing high cost services, 
like support on weekends and replacing with informal supports, could be purchasing additional care and services from their own funds, it could be supporting them to transfer to another provider that is better able to meet their needs, or the benefits of residential care, either as short-term respite to complement their package or as a long-term option can be discussed. Remember, it's your legal responsibility to ensure that all risks associated with the older person's condition are clearly documented in their care plan and communicated within the organisation and with others where responsibility for care is shared. The third key risk area is clinical care. The Commission has found some home service providers do not have a robust clinical governance framework that enables them to provide best practice clinical care. And poor clinical governance can result in poor outcomes for older people, even where clinical care is not being delivered. Some providers that do not provide clinical care fail to appropriately consider clinical matters, which should inform the delivery of care and services and identify risks to consumers. Let's take a closer look at what the specific risks are. The fundamental problems are a lack of clinical governance, policies, procedures, and validated systems for clinical care, and an inability to proactively address related problems. Where and when this happens, we could see risks like unclear pathways for reporting, escalating, and responding to risks and issues that may impact the clinical care of consumers. When faced with an issue or risk, it can be difficult for care members or nurses to know how they should report the problem. Another risk is ineffective systems for ensuring workers have the necessary skills, training and support to provide best practice clinical care. It's important for providers to make sure their workers have the skills and support they need to provide best practice clinical care. And limited mechanisms for monitoring care delivery and clinical outcomes to ensure conti care continues to meet needs and inform continuous improvement, leading to decisions that negatively affect both the consumer and staff members who provide the service. We could also see failures in a lack of oversight and of um, accountability for the coordination delivery of clinical care to older people. Without proper oversight and accountability for care coordination, delivery of clinical care could be ineffective or even harmful. Unclear roles and responsibilities. So when roles and responsibilities are unclear, it can lead to gaps in care planning, management, coordination or delivery of services, particularly when third, par third parties are involved. And ineffective information management systems. So workers are unable to deliver the care that the older person needs because of ineffective information management systems, which can have serious consequences for care. Poor clinical govern governance often results in poor clinical outcomes, and this is why it is a key area of risk in home care services. Some providers who provide clinical care don't have a robust clinical governance framework that enables them to provide best practice clinical care, while other providers who do not provide clinical care also fail to appropriately consider clinical matters which should inform the delivery of care and services and identify risk to consumers. Where you provide clinical care directly or subcontracted, pause here to think about your clinical governance framework and consider the questions on the screen. For providers who do not provide clinical care, pause here to consider the questions you can see on the screen. To summarise, to deliver clinical care and services, a robust clinical governance framework is essential. Consider the five points on the slide and ensure this is integrated into your clinical governance framework. I'll give you a moment to read these. For more information on what you need to focus on, refer to the risk guidance material from page 23. Remember, clinical governance is an integrated set of leadership behaviours, policies, procedures, responsibilities, relationships, planning, monitoring and improvement mechanisms. You should maintain effective clinical governance proportionate to the services you deliver. You should recognise that clinical matters can impact the person's wellbeing and risk in relation to the delivery of care and services. And this is particularly important for providers who subcontract some or all of their clinical care services. While some providers may not deliver clinical care services, you're still responsible for the provision of safe and quality care that meets the quality standards. The fourth risk area is about vulnerable consumers. Failure to identify and appropriately support and monitor vulnerable people can lead to particularly poor outcomes for those who are already at risk. 
First, let's look at some common characteristics of people who are most at risk or are vulnerable. This includes people who live on their own, live in a rural or remote region with limited service options, are socially isolated or lack close relationships, have few or no family or friends who check in on them, uh, they may have cognitive impairment and are unable to problem solve or speak up, they could have communication difficulties, have limited mobility, or are highly dependent on their caregiver or have only one carer. The Commission's found that some providers don't have effective governance or systems and processes to ensure they monitor and provide adequate support to vulnerable consumers. Pause for a moment to consider if you provide care and services to anyone who may be a vulnerable person. Where providers do not have effective governance systems and processes in place, their consumers are not receiving the care and services for the duration, frequency and quality required. There is a lack of information that may impact the delivery of care and services. And this is where information is not appropriately documented and communicated to those who need it, including where responsibility for care is shared. So you must be able to track the progress and outcomes of the people you provide care and services to. Uh, services to. You do this by documenting any information that may impact them, including where responsibility for it is shared amongst various stakeholders in an organisation or among different individuals or parties. And failing to fulfil this responsibility can impact your ability to track progress and outcomes of your consumers, communicate information and act upon it appropriately. And we've seen this theme come up in other risk areas we've already touched on. Also, staff don't understand their obligations to act ethically and with respect towards the older person, and staff are not trained and skilled to recognise signs of physical, mental or emotional deterioration, and this results in staff being less likely to make a correct judgement on the signs they are seeing. Other risks when it comes to vulnerable people include staff not trained to identify and respond appropriately to incidents. This can have a significant detrimental effect on a person. Staff must be trained to identify and respond appropriately in order for consumers to feel confident in the staff's ability to provide the best service possible. Next, staff are unclear about how to record, report and escalate any issues, risks or concerns. The consumer is often left in a state of confusion about how their care is being managed because there's been little communication from the provider regarding systems and processes. And it creates an environment where risks can go unchecked, needs are met or solutions proposed with limited insight into what really matters to them, leaving all parties unhappy and probably more non-compliance issues. And lastly, the provider can't identify, document and respond to concerns about a staff member's work or behaviour. Having the right process can make people feel safe enough to raise issues without fear they'll face action as a result, including termination, because there is no procedure for when things go wrong, which could save both time and money if handled correctly from the start. So needless to say, where providers fail to monitor and provide adequate support to vulnerable older people, this can have significant negative impacts on the person's health, safety and well-being. Going back to our list of characteristics of vulnerable older people, I'm going to focus on one of these areas of vulnerability and talk through some things you should be thinking about. Let's take a look at those that are socially isolated or without representation. Older people without close friends, family or other representatives may need particular support to make decisions about their care and services and may require close, regular monitoring to ensure their ongoing welfare. They may have experienced a shrinking of their social network. Consideration should be given to how they could be re-engaged or introduced to other connections and relationships. Think about again engaging with advocates, tap into a community visitor scheme, connect to culturally appropriate social groups, increase frequency of contacts or use technology so they can connect with others. And we saw examples, particularly during the height of the COVID pandemic, where providers expanded their range of leisure and lifestyle activities to help combat the isolation, fear and potential loneliness amongst the people they provided care and services to. Uh, for example, they purchased additional tablets and computers, they introduced Zoom, FaceTime, Skype, they employed more lifestyle and leisure staff to run more online activities. And it meant people weren't shut off from one another and remained connected with friends, family and the world through the internet. And these strategies are still relevant even outside of the pandemic. So for more information on the types of things you need to focus on for the other vulnerable categories I mentioned earlier, you can refer to the guidance from page 27. 
Remember, some people may have characteristics or traits that make them particularly vulnerable or otherwise impact their capacity to manage their own care needs, influence their care and services, or provide feedback and make complaints. They are more susceptible to abuse, neglect, and exploitation. You should consider who are the more vulnerable people your organisation provides services to, how you monitor them to ensure their health, safety and well-being, and how you regularly review the care and services to ensure their needs, goals and preferences are met. And consider how you ensure staff delivering services act in accordance with ethical and professional expectations. The last risk area is about management of packaged funds. This can also have a significant impact on consumers. The risk area description for this one is inappropriate use of home care package funds or failure to consult with a person regarding fees and charges, resulting in them receiving care and services that do not meet their assessed care needs. The Commission has received many complaints about inappropriate use or management of home care package funds and poor communication with the consumer about their fees and charges. So let's take a look at some of the key issues at the heart of these complaints. So what are the risks? lack of appropriate oversight of package expenditure for self-managed consumers who are reimbursed and or use debit cards uh, given by providers, a lack of transparency, so providing people with unclear or confusing monthly statements or not providing monthly statements at all, charging a person the prices outlined in your published pricing schedule where these have not been agreed to and documented in the home care agreement, and failing to clearly and accurately reflect the services provided to the consumer, the cost of each service instance, and the package management fees in monthly statements. Next is overarching or unreasonable or inappropriate charges. For example, using home care package funds in inappropriate ways such as television subscription services, payment of rent or uh, mortgage repayments. Uh, another example is charging for additional services uh, without proper agreement or passing the debt onto the person where a package goes into debit and charging excessive or unreasonable package management or care management fees. Also, engagement or communication failures. Examples would be failing to adequately consult or engage and seek mutual consent to any changes to fees and charges failing to work with the older person to promote use of unspent funds to help them live at home for longer, or failing to provide them with appropriate support to understand their home care package budgets and monthly statements. And then there are administration failures. This relates to failing to ensure the person receives the full value of the package when they are required to contribute a means-tested fee, failing to apply GST rules appropriately when charging a person's package or reimbursing them, failing to provide timely refunds where overcharging has occurred, um, failing to return unspent funds when someone exits the program, and failing to transfer unspent funds when the person changes providers or to transfer funds within the required timeframes. Now let's put this into context with a two-part case study where we will first hear what is happening for Mr Lee. Adrian Lee is 85 years old and is still living on his own at home. He was assessed for a level 2 home care package and has been getting help with shopping, meal preparation and cleaning from all good home care services. However, Adrian had concerns about the provider's charges and errors in his monthly financial statements. He never received services for his medication delivery, but was charged for them. Adrian wanted to use his funds for other things, like a new iPad. He thought he had some unspent funds in his account for this purpose. When Adrian tried to discuss this with the staff member delivering service, she sounded impatient and did not want to explain to Adrian what was happening. Adrian finally spoke with his case manager to raise his concerns, but he felt the case manager did not take his concerns seriously, and things did not change. Adrian wrote a letter of complaint to the board of All Good Home Services. Pause to take some time to consider how you would respond to the questions on the screen. Let's unpack this a little. What are some of the issues that the board should consider when handling Mr. Lee's complaint? 
errors in charging people for services that were never delivered, Mr Lee's understanding of his home care package funds, and Mr Lee's concerns were not addressed by his case manager. Second question, how should the board handle this complaint? They could con conduct an investigation, interview Mr Lee and staff and find out what is happening, audit the accounting systems used, and address Mr Lee's concerns about the charges and errors in his monthly financial statements. Refund him his services he was charged for but never received, so medication delivery, practice open disclosure, and Mr Lee wanted other services added like a new iPad. He thought he had some unspent funds in his account for this purpose. Discuss that with Mr Lee to see what he is entitled to. Our third question is how would the board know whether this is a bigger problem? They could interview other people in the service to see if the same thing has happened to them. They could look into the complaint and incident register to see if there are similar issues, investigate how similar complaints are being handled, and order other people's accounts to see if they've been overcharged. Let's take a look at part two of this scenario to see what happens next. As part of their investigation, the board also reviewed their latest report on complaints and noticed significant trends in the management of consumers' home care package funds. There were more complaints which included inaccurate or overcharges made to consumers' accounts, GST rules applied incorrectly, people complaining about the lack of consultation about fees, incorrect information provided on the service's published schedule, and lack of communication from the service when providing refunds. The board are responsible for ensuring all good services manages home care package funds appropriately and communicates to consumers about the usage and charges of their funds. Pause here to consider your responses to the four questions on the screen. Let's look at some considerations. Question one, how can the board ensure transparency in the management of home care package funds? They could check invoicing to ensure people can easily identify what they have paid for and how much they have paid. Um, any business costs, package management fees and surcharges, for example, for services delivered on public holidays are clearly identified. Question two, how can the board ensure that the service charges people accurately for their care and services? They should have policies, procedures and processes to only charge for care and services they have actually received. And where people are inadvertently overcharged, identify this and rectify in a timely manner. Consult with people before they commence services to explain the options available to them, including specified inclusions and exclusions and how charges are made. And ensure people have a clear point of contact to speak with when they have concerns or queries about their fees and charges. A third question is, how can the service partner with older people to help them understand their home care package? You can interview them and help them to understand their monthly statement through easy to understand information handouts. Explain any charges they query and discuss any changes to fees and charges with them before these are made. And ensure people understand they're able to transfer to another provider if they wish. You should not lead a person to believe they are locked into a particular provider. Also consult with them before they commence services to explain the options available to them, including specified inclusions and exclusions. And where a person wishes to use their home care package to receive services or items outside of the scope of the home care package program, you need to work with them to explain the intent of the program, the limitations and other ways they may obtain such services. Our fourth question is around what can the service do to ensure appropriate management of unspent funds, such as tracking, carrying over, transferring, or return of unspent funds. They could audit their accounting processes to ensure they are accurate in tracking, carrying over, transferring, or returning unspent funds, promote use of any unspent funds to ensure the person is able to live safely in their home for as long as possible with the best possible quality of life, uh, carry any unspent funds over from month to month and from year to year for as long as that person continues to receive a package and transfer any unspent funds if a person changes provider or return unspent funds if they leave home care. So this includes funds where they have topped up their home care package and expend client contributed funds first. What are some of the key points here? To ensure you're effectively managing people's home care package funding, you must be transparent, only charge them for care and services they have actually received, consult with the person and seek their mutual consent to fees and charges, work with them to ensure their home care package services meet the program's intent, and track, carry over, transfer or return unspent funds. 
As a provider, you have responsibility for ensuring home care package funds are being spent appropriately, that the older person understands what they're being charged for, and that they are being charged appropriately. Okay, let's move on to next look at managing the key areas of risk. You may recall I briefly spoke about risk management at the start of this presentation and said most risk management frameworks consist of the steps you can see on the screen. Although all providers manage risk to some degree, each provider may use different tools and techniques to support its risk identification, assessment, management, monitoring and control processes that are appropriate to the provider's size and internal legal and regulatory requirements. Consider how well done this is in how well this is done in your organisation and how robust your framework is. The effectiveness of the risk management framework needs to be periodically reviewed to ensure continuous improvement of risk management in your organisation. And this helps to ensure ongoing compliance and identifies ways in which you can continue to improve and manage risks. Also in the risk guidance from page 36 is a risk checklist tool that you can add to your risk management toolbox. You can use the tool to critically examine your organization's performance. It will help you better position yourselves to deliver quality care and services and ensure you're meeting the regulatory obligations as well as support you to cultivate a culture of continuous improvement. And the tool prompts you to ask questions relating to the five key risk areas. Think about your services, your systems, processes, your staff and funds management and respond in the text boxes provided. If you think about what has been covered today and what is expected of providers, you're expected to have systems and processes that help you identify and assess risks to the health, safety and well-being of older people. If risks are found, you're expected to find ways to reduce or remove the risks in a time frame that matches the level of risk and how it's affecting the older person. You need to escalate those risks within the organisation or to a relevant external service or organisation and continue to monitor risks to older people and others and take action if a risk has increased. Some takeaway messages from today are to understand the five key areas of risk that affect home services. Be familiar with legislative requirements and ensure your risk responses are adequate and appropriate. Integrate risk management of the key areas of risk into your existing risk management framework and processes. You have accountability for the delivery of safe and quality home services. Collectively, we're promoting a culture of self-assurance and risk awareness to support you to critically examine your organisation's performance and to continuously improve. Spend some time looking through the risk guidance. There's lots of useful information in there. Our online learning platform, Alice, is also a great resource with modules on some of the areas we've covered today, such as um, organisational governance, clinical governance, clinical care and risk, to name a few. That brings us to the end of this presentation. Thanks for listening and goodbye.